getting back to the question of the through line, what is it that you've noticed through your life that grabbed your attention and landed you in what you're doing? Yeah, great question. Um, you really, you really got me thinking. And maybe two different things. I mean, the first one is, you know, I like figuring stuff out. My father had a very figured out attitude, uh, his approach to life, um, and then growing up in my father under my father's roof. I mean, he expected his kids to to work and to figure things out. So I think it was, and I had no choice. Like you know, my older sister and I, he, my dad wanted a new garage. He handed us, we had an old garage in the backyard. He handed us crowbars and said, go figure out how to tear the old garage down. I think it was about 11 or 12 years old at the time. So what was but I've always enjoyed figuring things out. And I think that's the, the biggest piece. Did you go through a phase because, you know, I'm now seeing my grandchildren and, you know, kids can be a little bit ornery. Did you go through a phase where he said, figure it out, where you, you know, push back a little bit, but then as soon as you got into it, you got the self-satisfaction. Hey, it's pretty neat figuring stuff out. You feel pretty independent. Was was there a rebellious streak in you at all? Yeah, you know, and everybody's everybody has one at some point in time, and it manifests itself in different ways. Uh, so, no, I didn't. I wasn't. I was never openly rebellious. There was a period of time when I was about eighteen years old that I, I literally, my father never never struck me. The way, you know, a man would strike another man. Um, uh, he spanked me when I was little, not a whole bunch of times. But, you know, when I got to be more his size, he never struck me. And I made him angry enough for good reason when I was 18 that I was sure that he was going to pummel me. <laughs> but, uh, what happened? What happened? You know, I just I just became uh, at uh, the summer between my uh, senior year in high school and my freshman year in college, I became just useless just completely apathetic uh you know he sent me out on tasks and i would i would do a horrible job you know i was i was utterly useless and he uh, at some point in time you know he's paying me you know, he's not paying me to be useless i i remember he he had enough and he had you know in his business where his office was in mount pleasant iowa i remember him taking me in the alley behind the office and beginning to completely lose his cool at me. And I was certain that, you know, and I knew my father was very good with his hands. I never saw it firsthand, but I, I knew stories of him brawling when he was in the Marines. I was certain he was going to pummel me. And he did not, but he did get my attention. <laughs> do, you, do you think, uh, do you think it, you didn't, uh, you respected him, didn't you? Yes. And do, do you think that part of, and I, I'm a shrink, I dissect some of these things. Do you think that part of it was thinking, geez, not Are you charging me for this session? No, no, I, no, am no, I going to have to pay for this? No, but, I'm on a couch right now, right? But I'm seeing the situation. He takes you back there. He's about to lose it. He's really pissed off at you. But if I'm... Chris at 18, I'm thinking, geez, I really disappointed this guy that I respect. Yeah, well, that, that, there's a fair amount of cognitive thought there that sometimes 18-year-olds in, in the midst of all their hormone changes and growth can't really connect the dots at the time. Um, I'm not sure that I was bright enough at the time for that to occur to me. It, it did get my attention. Yeah. Um, I, I straightened up right away. I um uh, I remember the very next day uh, he found out that I did something right and he drove thirty miles to congratulate me. <laughs> wow! Wow! wow. <laughs> and uh, you know, then I think I slowly strained out my act. I mean, later, later that fall, I actually went out of my way to help him out on something that I knew he was he was having a real problem with, and I knew he appreciated that. So I, I think it sunk into my my subconscious, if not my conscious. That I disappointed a man that I respected, and I needed to straighten up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I've been blessed. I've had uh, eight mentors. They've all died. The last one was Larry King and a guy named Warren Bennis before him. And an impressive list. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I was very fortunate, and uh, but they, uh, I'll tell you, not disappointing them 
was the top of my list. I would never tell them I was ever going to do something unless I was 150% sure I was going to do it. And because their esteem for me was was amazing. You know, you know, when, when you get someone to think that, hey, you know, you, you might be kind of special in this way. There was nothing as good as that. And uh, uh, my father, my brothers and I, we had sort of a troubled relationship. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons I sought out uh, mentors and things like that. But get us back to you. You're the guest there. So you straighten out your life and then take us from there. And uh, what what came to be important to you? as you started to straighten out and get on with your life? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, doing the right thing. Um, it, that sounds like a cliche, but it's always been something that resonated with me. And, you know, despite all the stupid stuff that I did, you know, through my late teens, early, mid twenties, like really stupid stuff. <laughs> And we never stopped doing stupid stuff, of course, but uh, can, you know, you, the, the, can you just serve up one of those? Because see, one of the, one of the challenges my audience has is God, you have guests and they're just perfect. I mean, I can't do what they do because they're just perfect. I'm just some guy listening in or some woman listening in. And so the more that people can humanize themselves with a little bit of a humor so can you share one of the and i'll match you stupid and foolish for stupid and foolish trust yeah, me yeah you know and, that, and that's that's a great point to bring up too because that myth needs to be pierced i mean i in ferris's book tools of the titans i think that i was looking at several years ago one of my big takeaway early on was he said like all successful people have deep flaws. Like there ain't nothing out. There is no such thing as an unflawed human being. Probably no such thing as uh, uh, someone who's not deeply flawed. And all of your heroes and all of your idols are the same. They get they get real serious flaws. And so, yeah, that's, you know, just yeah, growing up in Iowa, uh, I grew up as fairly goody two shoes. Like the worst thing I ever did was drink beer illegally in a cornfield, or drink, uh, you know, drinking age in Iowa when I was growing up was eighteen, and I was I turned eighteen when I was still in in high school. With it, you know, I mean, even drinking and driving at all, I never got arrested for drunk driving, only by the grace of God, and which is why when a judge. Can't, and somebody is arrested for drunk driving, a judge realized that ain't the first time this person was drunk driving. You know, thank thank God for Uber and Lyft because they're you know they're they're no excuse for getting behind a wheel with any alcohol in your system now, and, and which is a rule that I pretty much stick to. I can't remember. I don't think I'm breaking that anymore, but uh, I did. You know, and I, and I was lucky enough that I, I never got arrested for it, and and I never got into an accident when I was drinking. Grace of God only. Um, and mostly, mostly stuff along those lines, because uh, I was, you know, in Iowa and the environment that I grew up in, like the worst thing I, I didn't smoke marijuana when I, when I left, when I left high school, I wouldn't even talk to people that smoke marijuana. And I got to college and there were people that I thought were really cool. And I'd be in a gathering and somebody would break out a joint and I'd be like, what? I thought you were cool. How dare you drink this or smoke this illegal substance? And and then, I, then I can remember. Then I didn't know how to refuse it. I was afraid to be around people that were refusing. And I'm sitting around in my fraternity one night on the roof, a bunch of guys drinking. And then they started passing around a joint, and they went to hand it to another guy in the fraternity that I really ha held a lot of esteem for. And he just went, "No thanks," and nothing bad happened to him. And I thought, "Wow, if it was, it's that easy just to say, <laughs> just to refuse if you don't want it." not just come to peer pressure. So, but you know, I did, I just, I struggled with my life like everybody else did. So, so you just happened upon that example where you said, gee, that's pretty simple. Just say no thanks. Because uh, if you're not familiar with Chris's work or uh, never split the difference, he comes up with these responses to almost any situation that, are what I call hidden in plain sight, brilliant. I never would have thought of that. And I think that would work. So, so can you share a little bit how that evolved? Because you are a master. I've watched you. People could, could hit you with, up with any question. 
and and you seem to have uh, a counterintuitive. I never would have thought of that kind of response. It's almost like you're almost an artist in the way that you do that. That's very kind. Yeah, you, you know, I just I I think my first approach is first of all, you know, I I don't care what works. I just want to know what works. Like I'm, and you were talking about Larry King being curious, you know, when you and I were talking earlier before and curiosity is a superpower. And like, I just want to know what works. If, it, if I get to figure it out, like, you know, what works and, you know, nobody figures stuff out without somebody spurring the thought in their head. Like they either see it done or in many cases, when we're teaching a black swan method, we won't give you the answer to a question until we burn the question in your brain. And we got an extremely intense negotiation exercise we put people through, extremely intense, called 60 seconds so she dies. We don't tell you how to deal with it until we, you know, until you feel like you've theoretically been beaten with, beaten with a baseball bat having gone through it. And then afterwards, we start laying out how, how to handle a high pressure, high intensity negotiation. And sometimes people say, well, what, you know, why the heck didn't you teach me that before you put me through the exercise? Well, you wouldn't have hung on to it until you understood that you had a problem that you needed solving. And so I think probably that smoking marijuana instance back, you know, when it was a horrible thing to do, you could go to jail for serious time for even being in possession of marijuana back in those days, right or wrong. I ain't saying it's right or wrong. It's the way it was. Like, I didn't know how to refuse just and 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 not be ridiculed or embarrassed. I mean, I was... I'm up in my head, my amygdala, which I know you're well familiar with what that amygdala does to you. You know, my amygdala is whispering in my ear, just like it does everybody else's. And and then I see this guy just go, no, no, thanks. And everybody was cool. And I needed to see somebody do it. I knew I'd been struggling with it. Somebody did it. I was like, wow, that's all there is to that? Wow, okay. Uh, you know, it didn't look that hard. <laughs> so can you ch share a few uh nuggets to whet people's appetites uh, that some of the things that you've observed you've learned you've taught that that when people hear it they'd say that's not so hard and uh, that would work you know uh, uh, so to build on what you just said i, I focus on what works you know yeah I'm, I, you know i'm i'm not trying to be some uh, super intellectual academic type i look at a situation it's got a problem what's going to work to fix it so can you share a few examples that that uh when people discover them they just they just smile in disbelief like oh my god <laughs> it's just it's so simple well yeah the opening story and never split the difference revolves around the phrase how am i supposed to do that and when somebody has given you a challenge that either is ridiculously difficult for you or you just can't do. Like, how, how do you not refuse, but how do you begin to telegraph to them that this is going to be a problem? Or how do you get them to maybe change your perspective? Like, and, and the response is not, I can't do that. The first response is, how am I supposed to do that? And that is like transformatively effective for people negotiating with difficult situations. Now, the downside of it is like eight out of 10 times, you get a 180 degree turn in the situation. Now, one in one in 10, you know, I would say two in 10 to be generous, but one in 10, maybe. It doesn't work, which you get, and people that are so used to that being a home run will get back to us and say, how am I supposed to do that fail? And we say, no, it didn't fail. It just gave you a different picture of what's going on. The one in 10 times that somebody turns right back on you and says, that's your problem. I don't care what happens to you. That's your problem. People are so flummoxed by that. They said, this failed. Well, it didn't fail. What happened was you got feedback that was different than what you expected. With that feedback, you just the person just blatantly told you, they do not care about you in any way, shape, or form, which now you got a set, you got a second decision to make. Do I want to continue? Is this a business partner? Is this a colleague? Is this a kidnapper? Is this a proverbial terrorist? But you now know what you're dealing with. And in our business and our personal life, the real answer there is move on. As hard as it is, this is a, you know, who wants to stay in a business or personal relationship? 
with somebody that doesn't care about you. But how am I supposed to do that? I learned that question from a Pittsburgh drug dealer. <laughs> Share that story a little bit quickly. Well, we, we had a kidnapping in the Philippines that had gone really bad right after a really successful one. The very next one was a train wreck, uh, uh, the Burnham Sabaro case. Two out of three of the Americans ended up dead. A bunch of Filipinos ended up dead. And in, in the midst of it, I knew that someone had acquired proof of life by getting one of our hostages on the phone. And to me, that was magic. Like, we, we'd we love to get proof of life, but we never got a hostage on the phone. So what the heck is going on if somebody else got a hostage on the phone? And not only that, who's doing that? There are multiple buyers for the same hostage? This is supposed to be a buyer's market. That's supposed to be a bidding war. And, I'm, and, I'm, and it flummoxed me. Never, never got the answer in the case. And then there's a drug dealer on drug dealer kidnapping in Pittsburgh. A few months later, one drug dealer grabs another drug dealer's girlfriend. Now, in the United States, when somebody in your family gets kidnapped, no matter what your op occupation is, you're probably going to the FBI. So this drug dealer went to the FBI in Pittsburgh. Nah, you know, help. So FBI hostage negotiators are riding around in the victim drug dealer's car, taping the conversations with the bad guy drug dealer, which I realize is a redundant term. But out of out of the blue, the victim drug dealer just asks a fair, natural question. And he says, I'll never forget the words. Hey, dog, how do I know she's all right? The how question. And there's this long silence on the other end of the line. And a drug dealer says, I'll put her on the phone. And that's when I went like, wow. It took, you know, somebody like this, this was eating at me. I didn't know the answer. And somebody in a very practical situation who was not a sophisticated FBI hostage negotiator just asked the natural and normal question that the other side has got to allow you to ask. They may not like, you may not like the way that you answer it. But this is a legit question. We started using various forms of how with every bad guy that you can imagine on earth. And it never made things worse. And nine out of 10 times, it made things exponentially better. You know, at worst, they always said, that's your problem. That's actually not an escalation. And it's, since it's more information, you're better off. But it never made things worse. Remember, you don't get in life what's fair. You get what you negotiate. If you want to become a better negotiator, click the link in the description below. That's where they're doing them carjackings. Boy gets kidnapped. Father's not an American citizen. He knows his son is. He goes to the U.S. Embassy. He says, my son's an American citizen. He's been kidnapped. You're supposed to help me. They say, the FBI is going to be there to help you. Now, I don't know what went through his mind when he was told that the FBI was going to be there to help him. I can imagine it was probably something equivalent of 15 minutes later, he's going to hear on the front door, and these guys will be there. They might even have FBI hats on. So you know they're FBI agents. But instead, about 15 minutes later, he gets a call from some guy in Washington, D.C. named Chris Voss, and he literally says to me on the phone, you're in Washington, D.C., how are you going to help me? How much time do I have before this father hangs up the phone? You're me. What do you say? Seriously, what would you say? Gonna get your son back. Logic. Lay some reality out to him. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. Interesting. Who thinks tell me what happened is an open ended question? It's a command. And it's a statement. Tell me what happened. When you run into people in your businesses, what's the first thing they say to themselves, especially if they're under stress? 
Is it any different than what this father said to me? Do you have any less time? And what you need to establish, you know how much time you have? Does anybody know how much time do you have before they either literally or figuratively hang up on you, before you're losing the game? How much time do you have? Seven. You got seven seconds. Tick, tick, tick. Tell me what happened. How much time does that take? Person under stress. Can they go, okay, I'm really glad you asked. You know, now that you think about it, let me go back through this. Think about it one step at a time. How did I get in? It all started when I was seven years old. I can't answer that question. I mean, who can under stress? Seven seconds. And what do you have to establish? What you have to establish is the same thing I had to establish. What, what, what is it? Trust. Absolutely. Trust and Competence, exactly right. You get two things, trust and competence. Not confidence, competence. And you get seven seconds. What do you say? Trust me, I'm confident. Trust me, I'm confident. <laughs> if that worked, would you need videos to market your practice? Probably not. Trust me, I'm from the FBI and I'm here to help you. How do I know how to do this? Because I did it wrong in the past. The first time I was in the Philippines on a case and I'm going to touch on it before we get done here this morning, they walked me into a room that the, the heads of the government are all there from the Philippines. I'm there at the express personal invitation of the American ambassador. The head of the FBI in Manila has gone to the ambassador and given him my name and said, we need this guy, and we have to officially invite him to come and help, and we need to walk him into this room where everybody, except the president of the Philippines, is going to be. The secretary of defense is going to be there. The head of the police is going to be there. Police in the Philippines is the national police force, so the head of the police is the equivalent of a cabinet-level position. And at the time, the president's two closest personal advisors were the secretary of defense and the head of the police. The only reason the president of the Philippines wasn't in the room is because then his personal confidential advisor was. And in some substance, they said to me, how are you going to help us? And I took this as the opportunity to lay out my resume. FBI agent, so many years. Joint Terrorist Task Force, New York City, one of the Attorney General's Award, one of the FBI Agents Association Award for Distinguished and Exemplary Service. Not only teach from the book at Quantico, now I've, I wrote the book we teach from. Not only trained by the FBI, but trained by Scotland Yard as well. Laid out my extensive credentials, and I could tell you they were suitably unimpressed. They may as well have yawned in my face. Why is that? You guys know why. If your credentials showed that you knew what you were doing, you would never hire the wrong person in your firm, and you would never fail, would you? Your credentials correlate loosely with whether or not you know what you're doing. Loosely. What I say to this father? Simple. Here's what I said. All right, Haitian kidnappers are not killing each kidnap victims these days. I realize that's really stupid because they kill each other at the drop of a hat, but they're not killing kidnap victims. Now, today is Thursday, and Haitian kidnappers love to party on Saturday night. If you do say the things I want you to say, when I want you to say them, we're going to have your son out late Friday or early Saturday morning. He said, tell me what you want me to do. And we had a son out Saturday morning. So let's break down a little bit of what I did do, and also, more importantly, what I didn't do. By the way, through the course of the kidnapping, the father never asked me how many kidnappings I'd worked. 
He never asked me how long I'd been an FBI agent. He never asked me how long I'd been a hostage negotiator. He never asked me if I spoke French or Creole, the languages. He never asked me how many times I'd been to Haiti. You guys may have asked yourself, this guy's a lead international kidnapping negotiator, and he's negotiated all over the world. How many languages does this guy speak? By now, the answer to that is abundantly clear, barely one. <laughs> how many times I've been to Haiti? You guys know how many times I've been to Haiti? No, I've never been to Haiti. Never ask me that. None of those typical competence indicators ever came up. As soon as I told him what he was looking at, here's what you're looking at. And then I offered him the slightest bit of insight into how to navigate that. And he said, tell me what you want me to do. I will also ask you to compare how long it took me to say that with how long it took me to lay out my resume, which was shorter. Most communication hacks, most ways to shortcut the, the actual process and make it last less time seem really indirect and save time. It seems like you're going in another direction and it ends up shortcutting the process significantly. What business are you in? I think you guys are in the trust business. What business was a hostage negotiator in? I was in the trust business. But take the word trust out and drop in the word predictability. And then things begin to change. Because as soon as you begin to make things more predictable and understandable, now you begin to help them in huge ways. Your clients, buyers and sellers, match almost exactly the psychological profile and reactions of the family members of a kidnapped hostage. Somebody's family member gets kidnapped, their child gets kidnapped, and their hopes and dreams for the future have been host taken hostage, have been hijacked. When your home is for sale, or you're trying to buy a home, these are hopes and dreams for the future. Very same profile. You can Google the most stressful events in people's lives, and buying or selling a home, especially selling a home, is very high on that hit parade. And the other interesting thing about this is the very same as a kidnapping, is when a kidnapping starts, the family doesn't know when it's gonna be over. Even though I know, I can guess within, if I know the profile of the case, and I know the country that it's in, I can guess within either a week or a month as to how long it's going to take. I know, but they don't know. They haven't been through this before. One of the definitions of traumatic stress is that it's unrelenting. They don't know when it'll be over. Your clients, your buyers and sellers, they don't know when this is going to go away. They don't know when it's going to be over, and that is overwhelming for people. That's why they call it traumatic stress. In the kidnapping business, we found out that the families of kidnapped victims suffered traumatic stress at the same rates as the victims because they didn't know when it was going to be over. Hostage negotiation. I've read the book. For those people that don't or that haven't read the book, um, you've, you've been in some crazy situations that led you to really have to understand how people think and how, like, the processes that goes through people's minds. And so, you're there, like what are some of the big takeaways that you learned in the FBI or things that like you don't think you would have learned elsewhere that you think the FBI does really well when it comes to understanding people? Well, you know, the great thing about being a hostage negotiator is um, you start out assuming that some of the crutches that most people want are never going to be there. Like there's a crutch that for us to make a great deal together that we have to have common ground. That's a crutch, it's a handicap. There's a crutch that I have to have alternatives. You know, our, my Harvard brothers and sisters advocate this thing called BATNA, best alternative to negotiated agreement. You know, and if you don't have a BATNA, you're screwed. That's a crutch. So it's really cool to start out negotiation learning from the beginning, like I don't have to have common ground with this person, I don't have to have alternatives. I could still make a great deal. 
And that's what the advantage of starting out from here to begin with is. And I don't care if I have alternatives. I don't care if I have no alternatives. I'm not going to be taken hostage by that. And I think those are the great things about starting out a negotiation where I started out from. And now, you know, we're taking this into business. When I started out, there was no such thing as emotional intelligence as a phrase. I mean, if you're aware in sales and business, uh, in any aspect of the life in general today, you know that you need emotional intelligence. Well, hostage negotiation is just emotional intelligence. So we really started out in a, in a master class on emotional intelligence and how to make a great deal with whoever you come across. I mean, I think that's what the FBI really gets right. So... I do want to get into sales, but I know my audience is going to want at least one story from the FBI days. So take us back to, and I'll let you choose either your first one or your most exciting one that you were actually the lead negotiator on. What did that look like? And how like nerve wracking was that for you as you're sitting there? Cause you've negotiated in some pretty high profile situations, right? Yeah. 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 And you know, what I love about most of the negotiations, um, you haven't heard of this, most of the stuff I did because we were successful. You know, there's a phrase in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, we get people out okay and you're not going to hear about it because everybody went home, everybody lived. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we had, some, we had some high profile cases. I mean, I, I worked on a case one time with a Fox journalist. Really? Very few people know about this guy. Steve Santani gets grabbed in the Gaza Strip. You, you, the reason you don't know about it is because we, we got Steve Santani out of that. Um, and he, he went through a horrific situation. And we did it with some really interesting approaches that the bad guys never knew we were there. The most dangerous negotiation is the one you don't know you're in. We negotiated through people where they had no idea we were influencing them. Those are great negotiations where... Mm -hmm your negotiation is invisible. So yeah, um, a lot of stuff that I did, you haven't heard of because uh, we did it well. So going into the sales part or side of things and coming out of the FBI, what, like, I know you talked about emotional intelligence and, and you say that like the FBI taught you a lot about that, but like specifically when it comes to like the pressure of sales, because a lot of the audience that, that listens to this type of podcast and that, you know, is in the Facebook group and on YouTube and whatnot, uh, they're like, hey, I get nervous, right? Or, you know, a big deal comes in, you know, I start to sweat, I get anxious or whatnot. Did, did the FBI teach you things specifically on helping you keep your calm and keep your nerves down? Or how did you go about figuring that out as we transition over to the sales side of things? Maybe not so much when, you know, people's lives are at stake or high profile cases, but in this setting of just, I don't know, intense situations, be that sales, be that negotiations of any sort, how important is and how did you learn that? All right, so a um, couple, couple things that I think will be really helpful. You fall to your highest level of preparation. You don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your highest level of preparation. You perform as you've rehearsed. And when you're satisfied with the process, um, then you just let the process work its way out. You don't, you don't, mm. you don't get rattled along, along the way. I've, I've heard an analogy being, um, you know, a guy's walking a tightrope guy or gal, they don't, they don't look at where they're going. They look, look down at their feet and they worry about the next step, you know, make the next step properly. Don't get rattled about where we're going. Let go of where you're going and focus on a process. And then in the FBI, I always learned we had the best chance of success which means we fail sometimes because there's no guarantee of success. I just want the best chance of success. So get in your head. You like your process. You got the best chance of success. You do as well as you can. The universe is going to let you succeed as well as you, as you possibly can. And then you get your practice in. You get, you get your reps in and understand that there's no one move that ruins everything. It's always an accumulation. So if you got a bad feeling, you're headed down the wrong path, there's a pretty good chance you need an adjustment. Maybe just a two millimeter shift, maybe a tiny little shift. I mean, I love that phrase from Tony Robbins. And most of us that are Tony Robbins fans use a phrase, let's make a two millimeter shift. You know, I would yeah. attribute that to him. So many people I know talk about that. So make a minor adjustment. 
and and then give yourself the best chance of success and 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 that's that's where you go and uh i, I probably rambled a little bit answered maybe one of your three questions <laughs> no no that's that, that's really really good and i like that a lot especially with the two millimeter um part i actually just wrote a, a playbook it's about i don't know 65 67 pages long or so about habits and about the mind and about um you know subconscious and whatnot and I, I talk about that specifically in there, not the two millimeters, but I say that like when you're going to change your life, when you're going to go try to rewire your identity, your brain, like you don't start out by trying to go and change every single area of your life. You certainly don't go try to go to your biggest habit and try to eliminate it just like that. You start right. root cause and you adjust it just a little bit. And those, I don't know, who is it? Peter, what's his name? Peter Sen Seng, I think is his name. The American systems guy was like, hey, you know, the, the smallest changes yield the biggest results, but the areas of biggest leverage are often, you know, the, the hardest to find. And I think that's super important uh, to recognize and understand. All right, guys, Chris Voss here, author of Never Split the Difference, CEO of the Black Swan Group, a team of negotiators who really will help you get better at negotiation. Today, what I want to talk to you about is negotiating smarter, not harder. How do we negotiate smarter, not harder? Well, the first thing is to think about how we treat the word maybe and things that sound like maybe. I'm kind of shocked. Uh, maybe not shocked. Uh, how many people use maybe or something to masquerade or maybe in the negotiations? We just exercise on a regular basis that we do with our clients when we're training them. We call it 60 seconds so she dies. You get a role play, a hostage negotiation where I am the bank robber. And I get you started. I say I need a car in 60 seconds so she dies. Only problem is the first rule of the negotiation is I've already told you that you can't give me transportation. And the first thing I do is I turn around and ask you for a car. You know, I've been surprised at the number of people that we train that have given me some version of maybe. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I could get your car if I just had more time. This overall theme of how to negotiate without bargaining. And again, it gets back to how do you negotiate smarter, not harder. Well, treat every maybe like it's a no, or anything that sounds like a maybe. Treat it like it's a no. Don't, uh, don't sucker for the hope side of it. Maybe I could get this, or I'll try, whatever that might sound, sound like in one way, shape, or form. Treat your maybes like a no. I had a businessman a number of years ago tell me as soon as he started treating all his, no, uh, all his maybes as a no, his business really moved forward. How do I want you to do this? Label it. Come back with a label. You could even say, you know, that, that, that sounds like a maybe to me. Or you might say, it sounds like there's problems here. Focus on the no aspect of this, the, the stuff that sounds like non-starters. Identify them, get them out of the way. Use labels to do that, and you'd be surprised at how much more effective your negotiations are and how far fewer times you get caught up in a quicksand of maybe. Negotiate smarter, not harder. I wish you the best. In your negotiate, negotiating days, was there an instance where it really didn't go the way you wanted it to go? Yeah, and with 93% success rate means 7% of the time it's going bad. And that's just, that's just the nature of the game. Is there one that stands out for you as being? Well, every one of them does. But then, then the issue is, do you learn? Like uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb would call it post-traumatic stress growth. Like you go through a traumatic event, um, are you traumatized by it, which and then damaged and never recover? Post-traumatic stress, uh, injury, harm, disorder? Or is there post-traumatic stress growth where you took that and decided to be better than you ever were before because you never want to let that happen again? When I, say, when I say this, what is the incident that comes to mind? Well, the first one uh, that people died in was the second case that I worked in the Philippines, the Burnham Sabero case. And early on, before we could even get our arms around uh, like a situation that was moving really fast and the Philippine military was engaged in chasing the bad guys and a chase had been on for weeks um, Guillermo Sabero was murdered uh, by, by the Abu Sayyaf about 21 days into that case. They had already killed a number of Filipinos prior to that. And as they moved across the landscape and the oceanscape and island to island south of the Philippines, they would, they would kill hostages and pick up new hostages. 
because there were people in their way all the time. So that was an ugly case from the beginning to the end. In the end of it, uh, uh, the two of the three remaining hostages were killed in a botched rescue attempt and they were shot by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Philippine scout rangers inadvertently stumbled over the Abu Sayyaf encampment, uh, didn't realize it was one that had hostages and it just opened fire. They recognized it as a terrorist encampment, formed a skirmish line on the trees on the uphill side and just started pouring um, rifle fire down into the camp. Uh, and so that was that was the first time that I'd worked anything where people had, had gotten killed. Does that stay with you? Yeah, it does. It does. And and I felt sorry for myself for a long time. And it's not like I'm um, I'm happy about it, but for uh, I'll never remember the moment that I got the call five thirty in the morning. I was in Washington D.C. where I lived, and a voice on the other end of the phone said, "I've got bad news. Martin is dead." And it was just a few hours after Martin Burnham had been killed and Deborah Yap, the Filipino hostage, had been killed. Martin's wife, Gracia, um, was wounded and lived. And I re I'll never forget that was the worst, that, to, to that point and since, was the worst professional moment, personal moment of my professional career. And I used to say it's the worst moment of my personal career until I was hearing another hostage negotiator talking about a siege he was in where uh, uh, an infant had, had had died, had been killed. And he, I remember sitting there watching him talk about it, and he's still very definitely dealing with the scars and the wounds from having been the negotiator on scene. And I remember him saying, like, you know, I don't know why I keep telling, you know, giving these presentations, maybe I just want people to know something bad that happened to me on a winter's day. And I was sitting there thinking, bad for you. That wasn't your blood, it wasn't your child. And I thought, you know, we're taking on too much because it wasn't a member of our family. It wasn't my brother, it wasn't my significant other, it wasn't my son that got killed. And that's when I tried to, and that's when I realized I had to put that stuff in perspective. It wasn't doing anybody any good for me feeling sorry for myself. I couldn't, and, and what we, the changes we made as a result of the Burnham Sabero case saved lives. You know, that was, that was our mandate. All right, so Martin Burnham is dead. What do we do with that? Do we quit or do we get better? If we get better, somebody else is going to live. And a whole bunch of people ended up living based on strategy adjustments we made as a result of, of that case. Seems like a big, a very significant sort of burden to, to carry, right? It goes back to what I said at the start. You know, it takes a certain type of person to want to be, want to play with those stakes, yeah, some, um, somebody who's naive. <laughs> yeah. You just don't know any better. Makes us difficult sometimes. I was just thinking about the, you know, the traumatic things we go through. It makes us much difficult, especially in forming relationships. I was I struggled with that a lot. I struggled in f f having a girlfriend, probably because my, my home life was so traumatic that I would always run from commitment. But when you've lived in such, through, and you hear the same with like soldiers and stuff, you know, when you've lived through such sort of traumatic events and high stakes, coming home to... Hey babe, you're right. Can be difficult, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it can be. It can be. It can be difficult. Like you can you can have difficulty unwinding. Mm. The other person depend upon how you process information. Like the other person might genuinely doing their best to be there with you to get you to talk about it. Mm. And you know if you if if that isn't the best way that you process it. Mm. And yeah, one of the very difficult things about me is I don't process stuff by talking about it. I'll talk about it afterwards, you know, but I, I kind of need, I need to unplug, you know, I'll need a good night's sleep. Mm. You know, I'll, I'll, need, I'll need to let it run through the data banks and kind of bake on its own. I'm probably pretty good the next day. Which is interesting because in your work, you have no time for that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and maybe that's why I need it more at home because in the work I, I mean we're gonna you know we're going on it right now we're dealing with it right now mm. mirroring something you talk about as well in the book which i find really interesting because again something with my girlfriend I, I started to explore which was you know when she says something to me or when she does something i to make her again feel heard i guess i just kind of repeat it back to her right but also trying to is it also a body language thing or is it just 
how, how does mirroring, mirroring work? Well, the hostage negotiator's mirror, the black swan's mirror, you know, the way that we teach in business now is just all verbal. Verbal, okay. You know, you, if, if, if you start lining up physically, uh, which is what the body language mirroring thing is, mm -hmm. like if, you, if, you, if that happens naturally, then so be it. Enough people try to do it as a manipulative tool that we're really leery of even coaching people on that at all. Like if we're talking and suddenly we both find us, and I'm actually listening and you're listening and we both find ourselves leaning in the same direction, that's cool because we're dialed in. Mm. But the body language thing is is a tool of manipulation so many times of people that are just trying to exploit you. That aspect of it, we stay away from. Now the hostage negotiator mirror, the black swan mirror, repeating just the last one to three words of what somebody said or then taking surgically, picking a gist, one to three words here and there. It's ridiculously effective. Ridiculously effective? Yeah. I did it's it you did, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's re and, and the thing that I find fascinating about it too is like if we find somebody that's really into mirroring there'll typically be somebody whose IQ and EQ both are real high and there are a lot of people whose IQ is real high you know their book smarts are good but their people smarts aren't good mm. and they tend to love mirroring because it's the least amount of effort with the maximum amount of response. And they want to guide a negotiation in a very gentle but purposeful way while the, and the other side doesn't feel guided. They feel like they're expanding. And it's been real consistent. So the moral of the story is um, never be so sure of what you want that you wouldn't take something better. Come up with a new strategy and be willing for good things to happen that you didn't expect. And that's what happened. Amazing, amazing. And what would you say would be, you know, looking back, your biggest uh, mistake? Wow. Um, there's so many. You know, and well, it was, really, it was really in a previous case that I was talking about where things went bad. Uh, because our mistake was... And I, I didn't even know. This is what happens to a lot of salespeople. And I heard a salesperson talk about it as being single-threaded. Like I'm at a sales conference a couple of years ago. And this woman's talking about, you know, she had a great relationship with the person on the other side. And the, she thought the deal was going down. And they got a signed agreement. And then he took his agreement back to his, uh, his company. And they said, no, we're not doing this. And um, since you separated yourself from us and agreeing to this, he, her counterpart, not only did she not get the deal, but they got fired. The guy, her counterpart got fired. Subscribe to the Black Swan Group's negotiation newsletter, which is free. Doesn't cost you anything. I had a colleague of the FBI that used to like to say, if it's free, I'll take three. Here's how you subscribe to The Edge if you're in the United States. Send the text to, the number is 33777, that's 33777. The text message that you send is Black Swan Method, Black Swan Method 233777. Comes to your email inbox on Tuesday mornings when you're ready to rock and roll and get after the week.